There's a lot of good in the president's tax reform bill. But one section is drawing opposition from across both sides of the congressional aisle, the death tax. Welcome to Wait Till You Hear This. I'm Steve Eastman. The death tax. It has an awful sound to it, don't you think? And nearly three quarters of Americans are against it. Dick Patton, president of the American Business Defense Council, is here to explain what all the commotion is about. Dick, welcome to our program. How about if we start with a definition? What is the death tax? The death tax, according to the official IRS definition, is a tax against a person's property and their right to give it to their heirs at the time of their death. It's a property tax, then. And I know Americans are usually more inclined to support any kind of tax in times of war, but they also like to see the tax disappear as soon as possible after hostilities end. Could you give us a little history of how the death tax began? In 1916, it was to fund World War I. By the way, the death tax as of September 8th this year is 101 years old. We think it's about time to get repealed and to die of old age if nothing else. What income levels are directly affected by the death tax? It's not incomes, but it's amount of property. Chiefly affects family businesses and uh, family farms and family ranches. What the IRS does is it comes in and they do their estimation of the highest and best use of your property and define the tax on it. And then the family has nine months to come up with the cash. And for the family to suddenly have to cough up 40% of the net worth of, you know, what dad or grandpa spent his lifetime building, by the way, and paying all of his taxes every year along the way, this tax, sometimes it outright destroys these businesses. Sometimes the heirs, the kids, have to sell it off piecemeal and, and part out the business and no longer exists. Sometimes they go deeply into debt. Now, the IRS does have a payment program that is 15 years long. They become the chief lien holder against the business. It puts them in a position where if they're going to make any major business decisions, they have to go to the IRS with hat in hand and ask the IRS's permission. That's terrible. I'm going to ask you for an estimate now. It may be difficult to come up with an exact figure, but how many family businesses fail each year which could otherwise have survived without the death tax? That is a question that we have been asking ourselves and have been asked of us every step of the way. And because of the the nature of the IRS records, it, that is an unknowable number. Well, so this is really a A big issue, even if you're uh, not directly affected being the property owner, it's still a a pretty big thing. Oh, it absolutely is. Let me give you one example, and and this is a family I've known for a long time. Dad is up in his mid-70s. He's got four sons. All four of them are involved in the business, and they've grown it. Dad started it in 1962. They've done their own estimates, and they realize that when Dad dies, they're going to have to produce about $39 million. They're not sitting on piles of money because every time they hit another juncture, their capital goes into is either new equipment or new technology or new buildings or some form of expansion. We currently have plants in Seattle, in Oregon, in California, and North Carolina, and they employ just about exactly a 1,000 people. I know for a fact that the wages and the benefits that they pay are above the average of the marketplaces where where they exist. They actually have been talking to a legitimate buyer who's at the table, who is offering them full price, and they're trying to figure out what to do with this because what their problem is is that this buyer who's offering full price, well, he has to recover that investment as well. And so his answer to recovering it is to take the entire company, move it to Indonesia where he can get very, very cheap and somewhat skilled labor and continue on. But that leaves a 1,000 families who depend on those 1,000 paychecks that this company provides without jobs and without paychecks. Well, let's take a a look at the uh, other end of the financial picture. 
How much does the death tax currently raise each year? Last year it raised $18.5 billion, and that was less than one-half of 1% of the federal budget. The government spent all of that money in 36 hours. So the death tax doesn't really contribute that much to the federal budget, and it makes you wonder what reasons are typically given for keeping the tax. I think one of the things that we have seen, and probably everybody listening to this program has seen and noted uh, to some level, is this drastic increase of self-identified socialism within the Democratic Party. And let's start with Bernie Sanders, but it has almost become sacrosanct within the political organization on that side of the aisle. If you go back to the philosophy, the underlying philosophy of socialism, and actually back to 1848 when Karl Marx and Frederick Engels wrote and published the Communist Manifesto, in that pamphlet, it is either a very small book or a very big pamphlet, whatever you want to call it, but there is a 10-point plan for the implementation of their worldview. And point number three is the abolition of all right of inheritance. I was just reading about that the other day, and I think you really hit the nail on the head there. As we're speaking, uh, votes are going on in Congress. We're actually recording this program on the first weekend of December, and it may be before we get it out there for people, things may have already changed. But at this moment, do you think there's any chance of removing the death tax from the proposed budget? I'm actually somewhat optimistic. I have had personally eight meetings with top people in the Senate in the last week and a half. We even brought in a couple of our economists. We took the amount of money that they were proposing to apply to estate taxes, and we literally created economic models of two different ways that they could reapply it and successfully repeal the death tax. And and I have communicated with these people as recently as an hour ago. They took our plans. They sent it to Joint Committee on Taxation. They're the ones who will project taxes 10 years out. And they have not yet received the score since they don't have that information. They're not including that in what they're voting here in about the next hour. That being said, on the House side, the plan that was put together by Kevin Brady's Ways and Means Committee, they do succeed in repealing the death tax. Furthermore, they are very, very, very focused on achieving death tax repeal. Okay, so if the House is against it and the Senate is for it, there's still room for a lot of negotiations before we know the final answer. So then they will, beginning sometime probably early next week, will go into what's called a conference committee. And there will be probably about 56 House members and senators split according to party total differentiation, you know, how many R's versus how many D's and so forth. But their job is to go into conference committee and to come out with an identical agreed-upon tax plan built from the bones of these two plans that have been passed already. And again, and I can't tell you who I've been talking to, a number of these meetings are off the records. I will simply say people at the very top of the House of Representatives, we've been talking to them, and they are very, very, very enthusiastic and motivated to achieve, among other things that are different from the Senate plan, death tax repeal. And and death tax repeal, I've been led to believe, is at the top of that list. And by the way, anybody who's listening to this program where this sounds motivating, would you please, 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 please call your congressman and call both of your senators? Call the senators first. They need to be softened up. Well, Dick, I think you've uh, really summed up arguments very well. I knew some of the stuff you were talking about. Some of it's new to me. I'm so glad that uh, you had a chance to visit with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Steve. It was fun for me as well. Dick Patton is president of the American Business Defense Council. You can learn more by checking out its website, businessdefense.net. This is Steve Eastman for Wait Till You Hear This. Discover more stories like this one on our website, waittillyouhearthis.com. 